sure. everybody can get money. Sure. And money was a vital ingredient for this whole thing. Yeah. And uh, he, he also knew people uh, who See, were specialists in certain areas, yeah. especially when it came to that income tax thing. Yeah. He would recommend certain people. See, he's a, he's a real estate man. A lawyer, but he's a real estate Is he manager. still in New York? As far as I know, I haven't seen Yes, he's still in New York. Stanley's still here. Uh, I don't know exactly where he's living, because since I, uh, it just happened that when I thought I had a heart condition, I happened to be recommended to the same doctor that is a doctor, but he's still here. Yeah, I Bob had helped uh, volunteer work 
and yet uh, been committed to come down to SCLC for the summer, but there has been no information. I was still at him, and there has been no information of his coming. But so when he came, uh, we were in the process of uh, trying to do things to SNCC. He had already set up a little office for SNCC, and so he helped out with that. And then uh, SNCC wanted to have this conference, and so they wanted to be sure to try to get some people from Alabama and Mississippi. And since I knew certain people, I suggested he go down to a certain places in Mississippi and see somebody. And that's how he uh, uh, began to think in terms of starting something in Mississippi. And Mississippi. Yes, the major person I read to make it into was Andrew Moore. Andrew Moore was down in Cleveland, Mississippi. And they had had a, had a vision for a long period of time of mass voter registration there in Mississippi and the uh, basis of numbers he felt that blacks could do a certain lot of things. So I missed the organization the meeting that they held in uh, the uh, latter part of the summer, I believe, in uh, the cold, because uh, when I left the SCLC, I was that I was going to stay around in terms of SNCC, largely not to, not to direct them, but to uh, and, and because I knew a lot of things. Yeah. So, and I had no ego that had to be satisfied, so I could afford to uh, just give without the need to project. And could affiliate with FCLC. 
the LC, but it didn't seemingly work out of that way. But this is an idea of one of the cornerstones of NCLC. This is the same idea of the Gordon and Yarn of the NCLC. As what? As the director of the Citizenship Education Program. Yeah, but who was there before the end?
bring it forward to you. Well, that, that highlights for what could be the value of television if it were used to educate and to motivate people. As well as limited, but even more so now uh, than it was uh, earlier. Uh, but uh, television, uh, it's one stage. Uh, there were some educational television programs for teaching people to read in the South. Uh, very limited for the youth, of course. Uh, but see, the people who were, with whom we were talking, uh, the leadership of SCLC, uh, they couldn't, that wasn't, that, they, they couldn't try that as much. See, they couldn't push, push put the energy. In the first place, they have never developed real organization. That's why now Ralph, who has given so much, Ralph Appleman, who has given so much not only to SPLC but to King, uh, out of the Montgomery struggle, uh, where, where is he now? Uh, SPLC is there in name, but the support is not there. And the, uh, I know that's why I wanted to make sure I get this question in. Uh, could you review what you regard as having been uh, from 1957 to 1968, and this is giving you a whole decade yet that I know you haven't thought about, what you regard as being the high levels and the low points in the CFC? Well, uh, that's the first. 57 to 68. I can't claim to have observed SCLC as closely since then as perhaps at the time I was there. I have, and because I do have highly critical reactions to some of the things that took place, I frankly would like to, I prefer not saying them until I wrote them out. Yeah, I'm doing so right here. But I think uh, one of the things that can be said is that I'm afraid in an effort to maintain spotlight on the national scene, things were going into much more hurriedly than the preparation for the more thorough. Uh, for instance, even the Food People's Campaign and uh, whatever else has ensued has been, uh, I'm afraid, here too much to try to maintain spotlight. And maybe that has virtue, I don't know. I'm sure there is some, there is certainly a question that can be raised, uh, uh, some debate can be raised between my way of functioning, which is to minimize projection, self-projection, and that of uh, which characterized most organizations and certainly reached a high state, if not the epitome, in SCLC, which was highlight self-projection. Uh, there could be quite a debate between the virtues of these things. But I think sometimes, you see, you can over-project. And I think also, number two, uh, the period had passed when the media, the television and news media, had the great need for what was happening uh, in the black world. At the time of the boycott, and the sit-in and subsequent action of SNCC. Basically, the news media didn't have a whole lot of, uh, let's say, exciting things to report. But, and so they concentrated on uh, that. But they, they aren't looking for their excitement now. What do you mean what I think of? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to 
if you just know this, you see, I left before they got involved in Albany, and I was in Albany when they, and when they came in, I think I went up there, uh, the young people had been problems and basically they still exist, I would do it. And I that's why I continue. Is that a thing, a major thing that you think that if I had to do this over, I would change it? You know, maybe in your life, that's what you tell me. I don't know that I can say that. Perhaps, maybe I might be a little more egotistic. <laughs> so you would be playing under the shadows there. Yeah, you have authority on this, do you, you know, you propose it. Do you write, are you consultant, do you consult work now? Or? From time to time, From time I have to time. I have done some, do some of it, and uh, that call that came through was... Uh,
Ms. Speaker, I'd like to, to begin the question this morning by asking you if you could uh, 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 discern to me the role you played in setting up the office of SCLC in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, the office of the SCLC was set up at the, I think I was in 19, the end of 1958, beginning of 58. And um, I came, I was asked to come down in order to facilitate a program that they anticipated having on the 12th of February, which was to have 12, uh, at least uh, several, and they wanted about 20 different southern cities to have meetings simultaneously on the 12th of February. And in order to do that, there had to be somebody to pull together the uh, program and to make contact with the cities and the like. So when I came in, there was no office. Uh, for the first couple of days, whatever functioning there was, I had to function out of a telephone booth and uh, in my pocketbook, to keep the notes in the pocketbook. And uh, through the help, largely, of the Reverend uh, Williams, Samuel Williams, who was professor of philosophy, I believe, at Morehouse at the time, uh, we did get an office set up. He was if without him, I don't know how we would have found, I would have found uh, an office that quickly. But so, well, yeah. SCLC uh, didn't move to Atlanta as uh, no. its headquarters until late A year time. after, no. uh, practically. But in the meantime, you were operating out of wherever you could find some space in Atlanta to try and, and coordinate uh, this uh, simultaneous meeting you planned for these cities in the south. Well, yes, you see, as I said, when I came there, there was no space. Nobody had made provision for space, hadn't even thought about it, I apparently had not. I had assumed that uh, certainly uh, we might have been able to function with some degree of sustained uh, a effort out of the church office of Ebenezer Baptist Church, since the uh, Reverend Dr. King Sr. was the father of the Reverend right. Dr. King, Jr. But this was not uh, provided for in the, in the full set. Uh, I had to accommodate myself to whatever time the manager of that office uh, felt that she, the uh, uh, mimeograph machine and other facilities could be available, usually after office hours. And so it was, as I indicated, uh, Reverend Samuel Williams, uh, we talked and we decided, pointed out, of course, it was very obvious that you couldn't function effectively that way. So he succeeded in getting space in uh, uh, the original office address. I've forgotten that the name, the address now of SCLC on Auburn Avenue. Got it. Was uh, Reverend Williams uh, acting in the capacity of a concerned official of SCLC and trying to help you find space? or was he acting as just an uh, interested uh, citizen in trying to get you uh, as, as, as decent a place as you could to coordinate your program? Well, he was uh, part of uh, the SCLC, uh, and I think the uh, both factors would be, uh, uh, you'd have to credit him uh, with both factors, that he was an official, and he was knowledgeable enough to uh, uh, be to realize that you couldn't function without some space. Very good. So, so uh, then uh, SCLC as an organization uh, didn't seem to regard this as a serious problem, the fact that you didn't have office space in Atlanta. Uh, otherwise, they would have made some uh, some concessions with me. Well, I would think so. You see, SCLC had not, I suppose, grown to the point of uh, understanding themselves or understanding organization sufficiently to uh, uh, be to be aware of the loss of momentum that could come from just being just coming in and trying to create out of there. You see. Uh, do you have any knowledge at all about who may have recommended you for that position? Well, I think I know who 
recommended me. I don't think it was a recommendation. I actually, that that point, I was drafted. I was drafted without my own uh, consent. Explain that to me. Uh, I think I had indicated to you sometime earlier that there had been a series of conversations and dialogue uh, with and between myself, uh, Stanley Levison, and uh, by Rustin. That was even prior to the, let's call it the formation of SCLC. Right. And at the initial meeting at which it was, SCLC was organized in 57, I believe it is, of course, I was down in Atlanta with Byer. Uh, and preparing materials for that meeting. So, this could... You might be interested now that I have a number of work papers that were prepared. I don't know exactly who prepared them, but I do know that work papers were prepared at the first meeting in January and the one in February. Well, the work papers uh, in the first meeting in January were prepared. Uh, the content largely by buyer. Uh, and the format, the format of it, uh, I did it because I I like to f set things out in the uh, form that you could see easily. See, but uh, so I was sent there by the dress by this method. I was meeting with the the three of us were to meet and. Um, Wyatt and Stanley had gone out to the airport to talk with Martin as he passed through New York, going where I don't recall. They came back and told me that I had been drafted to go to Atlanta and to set up the uh, to this program of the Crusade for Citizenship for these twelve meetings, for these twenty odd meetings. Prior to that. It had been assumed that by it he could go down. Uh, but uh, he was not available, let's say. And uh, I was very provoked because I'd never at any point Given in my life. Consent, no, had you contributed. no, I had not planned to go and uh, to be drafted in the sense of being being said, having it been, been said that I would come when I hadn't been consented. That, my ego isn't very the pronouncement, but I suppose that aspect of it, uh, my ego, uh, is easily touched. To not to ask me to do what to, to designate that I should do something without even consulting me. Right. But I went. But let me ask you this: This is the first major uh, civil rights undertaking that I think in the history of this country, whereby a woman has been uh, granted. Uh, seemingly, ostensibly, significant policy-making kind of <laughs> position. Now, were you taken by that? Was no, that gratifying? Oh, no, 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 because I knew it wasn't, uh, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have any significant role in the minds of those who did the, uh, who, uh, who were, uh, who con constituted the uh, uh, organization. Uh, I'm sure that basically uh, the assumption is all was, and perhaps the assumption still prevails in the minds of those who remembered the incident of, of my being there, that I was just there to carry out the orders of the Dr. King and somebody else. Okay. But incidental, and it was not, uh, since there was no designation of authority, I wasn't a person of authority. So when you first moved into uh, SCLC, your actual uh, work designation was never really specified. You were just called in to assist them in a project that they didn't know too much about, namely the coordination of a voter's uh, uh, project throughout the side, a spontaneous one at that. Is, yes, is that they correct? Were getting together the meetings and uh, preparing material for it. In fact, there was nothing, they spelled out nothing because they didn't, there was nobody to spell out anything. They were searching for projects? Well, they had in mind, you know, they, they conceived, the idea was conceived of as being, of having dramatic and let's call it far-reaching impact, of having 20 meetings or 22 meetings simultaneously on February the 12th, which was, which I think is the official date of, of uh, Douglas's birthday, Frederick Douglass's birthday. 
and uh, some white president, uh, uh, what's his name, Jefferson or Lincoln or what? Lincoln, I don't know no, what Lincoln, is. yes, his is near that period. I think, I think, I think there's a difference of a day in the in the dates of the two births, but as I remember it, in my thinking, it was. Uh, my obeisance was paid to the fact that it was more, it was near Douglas. the Douglas's birthday. Well, I have read where others uh, gave credit <laughs> to the fact that it was one of the white presidents' birthday. Yeah, well, let be it as <laughs> let it be. <laughs> let it be. <laughs> yes. But uh, and uh, my coming was, as I said, uh, to do to see that this be done. Now, how it was to be done? Who was to produce to do this, that, or the other? There was nothing. Uh, I think uh, I, I guess there must have uh, must believe that both uh, Stanley and Byatt knew that I knew something about organization having uh, functions. See, I had functioned both as, as a field person uh, with and as a national office staff member of the NAACP. I had uh, had other kinds of uh, call, let's quote call it professional positions. And so uh, they figured that with the, the input that would come down yeah. you see, from them, and, uh, that we'd have something right, going. Right, right, right. I can understand. That, that, that seems to be... So it's certainly, by, certainly by no stretch of the imagination can it be a conscious effort, be considered a conscious effort on the part of the official dom of SCLC to provide uh, uh, input from a female as such. Okay. If anything, it would be to the contrary. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, how long was it that you were working on your project before uh, uh, they hired an executive secretary? To, you an executive that? director. Executive director. Yes. I think it was, um, as I recall, see this project uh, to which I had uh, given in my thinking. Um, uh, let's call it two months. I had said it would take me a certain number of weeks to. Uh, set it up, because I think I went there in the latter part of uh, the earlier part of January, and uh, I was, this was to come off on February the 12th. I planned to stay six weeks, uh, the month to do it, and two weeks to clean it up. Um, this had, but, I, uh, but it didn't work out that way. Then they began to talk about uh, having an executive director, and uh, naturally they wanted a minister. Who brought up this idea about an executive director? Oh, I don't know that I can recall anybody in particular. I think it came out of what might have been considered whatever there was of an executive uh, group, uh, the board of uh, the, uh, the, maybe the executive committee. I don't think that even constituted too clearly uh, prior to the uh, February 12th meetings, uh, the delineation of different groupings within SCLC. They had an executive committee. And then they began to see there were pressures. There were pressures for uh, a format uh, and a, me a mechanism to implement whatever they had been talking about doing, of uh, providing an organization. Who was applying pressure? I, I think the ministers, many of the ministers uh, who had been initially a part of the uh, formation of SCLC. You see, the meetings prior to uh, this, uh, you referred to uh, the initial meeting in January. in January, and then there was a meeting in New, in New Orleans, and uh, which I gathered was largely a matter of, uh, let's call it a board meeting and big mass meeting, but the continuance of a program, and even the spelling out of a well-defined program, and implement and dividing, uh, dividing the, mech the machinery for seeing it through had not taken place. And there were some people who I'm sure uh, would be very much disturbed by this. And some had had certain kinds of experience. In my way of thinking, I would uh, immediately think of persons uh, like... Um, Reverend Miller Smith of Nashville. Kelly Miller Smith of Nashville. I would also think of uh, uh, the... Um, uh, what's the man that was in, uh, not in uh, New Orleans, but... Uh, uh, Simpkins? Well, uh, no, well, Simpkins, yes. Jameson? Well, uh, Jameson, especially, you see. They would be, they would be questioning for something concrete. Some others, no doubt, you see. 
Baker. I imagine Reed. I'm not sure whether Reed was in the, that early. Reed of Norfolk. Of Norfolk. Yeah, I don't think he was. What about C.K. Steele of Tallahassee? Well, I imagine he would uh, be concerned, but I don't think he would be... He was more uh, concerned... Of, he didn't want to uh, maybe violate his relationships with Martin. I see. There was a, there was a certain deferential consideration that they had uh, to maybe sometimes too deferential in terms of trying to force something through. Good. I want to ask you about that later on because I do think it, it's crucial that I try and get these uh, uh, kinds of relationships they had. Yeah. And that'll be one of the real points. I want to move on to, to the selection of uh, the executive director, uh, 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 who was Dr. Reverend John Tilly out of Baltimore, which yeah. I won't care for us. So, no. yeah. But uh, he was uh, eventually uh, chosen as the executive director. Can you explain to me that process and who selected him or who recommended him? Well, I'll answer the last question first. I recommended him uh, largely because of two things. One, they had talked in terms of quote, end quote, finding an executive director. Uh, I knew, number one, that they were biased towards a minister, and that uh, I felt they ought to also be, it ought to be somebody who had had certain kinds of experience. And uh, uh, prior to reaching Dr. Tilly, uh, I had interviewed, or at least talked with um, the person in Atlanta whom they had whose name had come up occasionally, who was uh, also a minister of the... Dr. Pitts? Yes, Dr. Pitts. And I knew Dr. Pitts, you see, from the, my early NAACP days, and so he, he had been, uh, there had been overtures made to him. I don't know, I think he called me and asked, oh, well, at least we talked to each other, and he just had come by and talked with him. I think he wanted to ask some questions. I know he was. Did you encourage him to take it? No, I didn't. I would didn't. I neither encourage nor discourage. I because I felt he was a man of uh, he had a sufficient amount of knowledge and background and experience to be able to evaluate whether he should or should not. And uh, I he did not have a great enthusiasm for making that shift. And I think he had reasons for it because uh, I don't think he would have felt quite as free. Uh, he didn't feel that there was an atmosphere. Now, I'm, I shouldn't put this in, but there's, there's, yeah, there would be an atmosphere of, of freedom of operation. He wasn't too clear. He didn't feel that there was a clarity of organization and procedure that uh, would suit him at that point. Right. That, that seems to be a pretty I think, accurate observation yes. at that time. Yes. And so then, uh, so then uh, the next uh, uh, move, I guess there may have been others who they had approached, I don't recall. But I suggested uh, Tilly, because I knew uh, John, Dr. Tilly, uh, he was a theological student, senior student at the school at Shaw when I was a student there. And I knew him as a person. And I had read uh, of the credentials that uh, were attributed to him in terms of having conducted a very successful uh, voter registration drive in Baltimore. And so uh, I suggested him, and um, it took a little while before anybody saw him. In fact, nobody saw him until I had further suggested that uh, we, that was to Stanley, that we talk to him. And so Stanley underwrote the... Let me get this now. Let me get this. You first suggested to some members of SCLC? Yes, I suggested the name. And there was a slow response? Yes. And subsequently? Subsequent to that, you talked to Stanley. Yes. And I may have, it may have been almost simultaneous to mm -hmm. let Stanley know about this okay. thing. But you see, the uh, uh, there's still the question of where the initial move That's officially right. should come, Certainly. from which it should come. And so this information is, let's say, turned over to Dr. King. Okay. And uh, no motion. Okay. And so then uh, uh, we further suggested. Uh, uh, let's have, you know, conference with uh, Tilly uh, to feel him up. So he came to New York, and uh, we met at an ice cream parlor <laughs> there on 125th Street, St. Nicholas Avenue. And um, I think it used to be called Thompson. I don't know what it's called now. But uh, we met there, and of course there was no problem with Tilly and me 
because we knew each other from way back. And so he uh, seemed to be interested. And uh, then that was followed up, eventually followed up. He was invited to come to Atlanta, I think, to meet with uh, an executive committee. And uh, uh, eventually he was uh, designated as the executive director. Okay. That's how it took place. And the initiative came from uh, this meeting that you and uh, Mr. Levinson had yes. with him in uh, yes. New York. Yes, in New York, yes. All right. Now, do, do you know how long uh, Reverend Tilly served as executive secretary? Uh, I can't recall the exact dates, but it seems to me it was less than a year. Uh, he came, he did, but not full time. He had made, pro made uh, provisions to continue his pastorate of a given church in Baltimore. And so he would uh, commute from time to wait for several weeks. Uh, uh, and uh, I think he came in, and it seems to me the initial meeting that he attended was the one we held in uh, Mississippi. Clarksville. Clarksville, Mississippi. That was labeled as the greatest meeting yet. I think I did that labeling, I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Now, the question was that propaganda or was that a No, problem? I mean, in terms of, uh, I don't know where, how it was labeled. Where did you get the labeling from? Uh, I have it down in, in some of my notes. Yes. Now, we were talking about uh, Reverend Tilly and his being appointed executive director, and uh, you, you were trying to recall the first meeting he attended, and was this at that Clarksdale meeting yes, in Mississippi? Yes, right. it was there. It was in Clarksdale. Yeah. What kind of a speech a speaker was Reverend Tilly? Was he as dynamic a speaker as, say, a person like uh, Reverend King or Y.T. Walker? What kind of a delivery did he have? Well, he had very good delivery. It was not as uh, uh, forceful in terms of uh, uh, what might have might be called um, uh, dramatics uh, as uh, Martin's. His voice wasn't as resonant, but it was. He had a clear voice and good thinking. Uh, he had uh, very good thoughts, and of course, he had been speaking a long time. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, can you recall any uh, frustrations he might have experienced which uh, caused him not to just stay on at SCLC in longer than a year? Uh, do you know, if, 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 do you have any ideas to the reason why he left SCLC? That's the point of the question. I don't think he spelled out, uh, certainly to me, or I'm not even sure if he spelled out uh, to the board any specific, uh, let's call it gripes, uh, about SCLC per se, uh, but I think uh, the uh, the rationale that was provided was that uh, he found it necessary to uh, give more time to his church work. He didn't find it quite viable to continue to have to commute to and uh, to and, uh, to Atlanta and be able to work away both from home and the church over periods of time. But during the time of uh, Reverend Tiller's uh, tenure, uh, he was given the title of Executive uh, Director, and they uh, labeled you Associate Executive Director. And after Reverend Tilly uh, departed, you became Acting Executive Director. Number one, how did you feel about his leaving, and what did you think of the position of Executive Acting Executive Director? Well. Uh, what did I think about it? How did I feel? How did you feel about it? Well, I had no ambition uh, to be, uh, uh, let's call it, executive director. If I had had it, I knew that it was not to be. And why do I say that? Uh, two reasons. One, I was a female. The other, I guess the combination of female and the non-minister, plus the uh, kind of personal, personality differences uh, that existed between me and the Reverend Dr. King. See, I was not a person uh, to just be enamored of anyone, and uh, my whole uh, my philosophy was not one of uh, nonviolence per se, and. Uh, I knew enough about organization, at least I thought I knew enough about organization, uh, to be critical of some of the 
lack of procedures or procedures that obtained in SCLC and within the inner councils wherever there was uh, discussion uh, I didn't while I did not try to force myself upon them recognizing the, the sensitivities that existed uh, I did not hesitate to voice my opinion and uh, sometimes it was uh, the voicing of that opinion it was obvious that uh, uh, it wasn't a very comforting sort of a presence I presented, you see. Was any of these uh, sensitivities regarding a female being in, in a power position in the organization ever explicitly expressed, or was it just a feeling or uh, presumption that you had in this regard? Well, when you say explicitly expressed, I think uh, the nearest to it would be the fact that, number one, when brought down, although I had the full responsibility for doing whatever was being done, I was never uh, uh, offered a position, an official position by way of title. That, I think, would be. And then when there was the bringing in of an executive director, uh, the, uh, I think there was a willingness on the part of the official dumb to permit me to just stay on without even dying. Uh, and so I think um, it may have been some of my friends who raised the question with me, and so I maybe raised the question too, that at least I should have, uh, I should keep some record of where I've been. And uh, I think the, and there was, there were hit the number of occasions on which I differed very sharply uh, when there was discussion came. And uh, because I just, I could not, I never was one to just uh, agree on the basis of uh, the uh, position of the other fella. And when I say position, you know, the, the, the international and national and right. of the individual had nothing to do, in my thinking, with what the, uh, an opinion that was expressed. But the opinion that I did not concur, uh, the prominence of the individual was not a bar to my race saying it didn't. Uh, uh, and you almost certain that your name was never figured prominently in the search for an executive director. Oh, I know that. I was uh, after the first meetings. I think maybe it was after the Clarksdale meeting. I'm not too sure whether I think it's, but I think it's Clarksdale. And then there were some subsequent meetings that I, I had a meeting, special meeting with ministers in Mississippi. And nobody was there but me. Uh, nobody from the organization. Uh, I think um, I did bring... Um, um, one of the persons from Nashville, uh, I can't recall who came, but anyhow, um, there was a, a Reverend a Methodist bishop, I'm not sure whether he's a bishop, I believe he was, I have to check the record, who, who voiced openly, he was so enthusiastic, you know, about quote, end quote, uh, my uh, demonstration of capacity to mm -hmm. get something out of nothing. Because I had to create material. Sure. I had to provide uh, uh, some kind, I had to not only uh, create it, but had to break it down so that they could use it. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, occasionally I had opportunity to uh, raise questions in council. And so some people got impressed, and he recommended openly that <laughs> immediately I become the executive. So, How was that there? <laughs> How was it dealt with? That's right. <laughs> I don't recall whether it, uh, I don't recall any verbalizations at the time. They probably were uh, to the effect that, uh, uh, well, at this stage, you know, it's not ready or something to that effect. Uh, but it, nobody ever took it seriously. I mean, the official dumb didn't take it seriously. In fact, if anything, it was an irritant. And uh, as far as I was concerned, I knew it couldn't be. So I had no, I mean, I had no aspirations, and I had no in, uh, no uh, uh, illusions as to the possibilities of it being. See, I was not a young person, that's number one. I was old enough to be the mother of the leadership of the organization. And I was dealing with ministers whose only sense of relationship to women in organization was that in the church and the role of women in the uh, southern church and maybe all of the churches but certainly the southern churches was that of uh, doing the things that the minister said he wanted to have done 
It was not one in which they were credited with having creativity and initiative and capacity to carry out uh, things, uh, to create programs and to carry them out. And certainly, uh, that uh, uh, was not my concept of uh, functioning. You, say, no. you see, if this is the dilemma that I see in this whole uh, episode, and I'd like you to react to what I'm about to suggest, is that I can see that I had a fantastic respect on the one hand for your ability, but an equal amount of fear for, of, of, of your potent, potentials and independence, on the other hand, because they never did make you an official, a bona fide, top official of the organization, yet they gave you bona fide top responsibility, namely uh, the establishment of this uh, program that they wanted to have such profound impact on the country at the time. And, and this is a kind of an ambivalence that's, that's difficult to digest. It's hard to understand that. Well, I don't think it's too difficult to digest, you see, uh, in the, if you look at it from the perspective that here was a young leadership that came out of a background that had little or no uh, prior experience of working with an effectively uh, uh, trained black, uh, well, it didn't have to be black or white, certainly an effectively trained and experienced organizational woman and uh, who had had uh, the kind of experience that I had had, and who was not uh, uh, loath to raise questions. And to uh, I did not just subscribe to uh, uh, a theory just because it came out of the mouth of And to uh, I did not just subscribe to uh, uh, a theory just because it came out of the mouth of uh, the leader. And so it was too difficult. This was much too difficult. I was too old to be... Uh, Intimidated by uh, the presence of... Well, not only that, uh, in terms from their perspective, you see, I had no... Uh, the uh, I was too old to have any uh, interest, create any interest on a man-female, man-woman basis. I wasn't a, a, a fashion plate, and make no make no bones about being a fashion, not being. Come in. I think we were talking about uh, 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 their respect for your ability on one hand and uh, fear of, of, of your independence on another. This is the way I perceive it, you know. And uh, in addition to that, uh, maybe they didn't regard you as. You suggested as this kind of a female animal that was yes. fitted to their scheme of things, you yes. know. You didn't have that kind of a relationship with them. That, uh, no, and I, and I didn't, uh, I didn't provide, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a show plate. I mean, it's nothing that you can see the, that the attitude, the average attitude to of the Southern Baptist ministers at that stage and maybe still uh, was as far as their own women concerned, was that they were nice to talk to about such things as how well they cooked, mm -hmm. uh, how beautiful they looked, and uh, how well they carried out a program that I had, uh, that the minister had de de delegated her to carry out, but not a create, not a person with uh, independent and creative ideas of his own, whom, and upon whom they had to rely, you see. This they could not tolerate. And I can understand that they couldn't, and especially from a person like me, because I was not the kind of person that made special effort to be ingratiating. I didn't try to insult, but I did not hesitate to be positive about the things with which I agreed and disagreed. As they asked, uh, I might be quiet, but if, they, if there was discussion and I was supposed to be able to participate, I participated at the level of my thinking. Very good. And this brings us to another aspect of, of SCLC, and that is the decision-making aspect. Uh, you just mentioned the fact that you did participate in a certain discussion. Now, uh, can you recall how decisions were finally made in these kinds of government uh, discussion groups? Well, I think it would vary from time to time. I think um, uh, how it can you recall any of the outstanding personalities there, the ones who seemed to have dominated the discussions, 
or the ones who seem to persuade others to their point of view. Uh, this is what the whole decision-making process and the identification of those individuals who seem to have had the greatest influence. I'm not sure that I can specify with any degree of accuracy uh, other than to indicate that persons who had been, let's say, number one, closely related to the Montgomery movement uh, had a certain brought with them, let's say, certain credentials as a result of that. A person like Fred Shuttlesworth, who had on his own initiated a program in, in Birmingham at the close of, uh, at the point at which the uh, NAACP's activities were banned, and uh, persons uh, who uh, were, who had some, quote, standing within their own communities. Uh, that was uh, like the Reverend, uh, I've forgotten his name, from uh, New Orleans. Uh, 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 Jameson? Jam no, Jameson. Well, Jameson was Baton Rouge, but uh, that was uh, who had a very big church in New Orleans. See, all of these, the factors that usually influence a one minister in terms of his relationship to another minister, uh, especially within the Baptist hierarchy, uh, such things as the fact that he was big in Baptist circles, had a big congregation, and that sort of thing. These were, I think, operated also in terms of uh, how well people were uh, listened to. But in the final analysis, you see, uh, there was a deferential consideration on the part of the men themselves, both in terms of uh, their not being present, but let's call it at the uh, center of the uh, of the locale where the organization supposedly had its office, and a deferential consideration uh, towards Martin because of uh, his role uh, interna nationally and internationally, the, uh, the image that had been created. So uh, what you had was uh, at points open and, and frank discussion, I think, and an effort to find uh, uh, at least they voiced their opinions. But in the final analysis, you see, the decision for implementing this was left to a large extent uh, to the president. So I don't know whether this touches upon the point you... Certainly, yeah. it touches upon the point, but I can understand the difficulty involved in specifying certain individuals. Uh, the category you mentioned uh, was certainly useful, uh, namely that... Uh, based on the Baptist hierarchy. Uh, the minister was the largest congregation. The standing in the... Following, the standing in his community yes. certainly had a uh, definite influence on the outcome of certain things. Uh, but in the final analysis, it was left up, up to, to Martin as yes. to what would be done. Let me ask you this. Was there, can you recall any individuals who refused to well, other than yourself, who refused to defer in most instances to the wishes of Martin. Uh, was there any coalitions formed within the uh, body politics, like a decision-making body of, 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 of SCLC? Uh, no, I think at that stage, you see, this was uh, the pervading atmosphere was one of uh, uh, we have something uh, great uh, we have a great person, and uh, uh, we must try to uh, make uh, use of this uh, and not be divisive. I think that was, uh, this was a, a consideration on the part of the people who were there. Plus the fact, uh, the, the lack of prior experience on the part of many ministers with dealing with organizations of this type. See, they didn't have, this was, this is different from a church Sorry. organization. And it had the, it was out in, let's quote, in quote, in competition with other national organizations. And it was a movement. And so, uh, uh, neither their time nor general inclination led, uh, motivated them to give, all uh, undivided attention to this organization as such and they were willing to as is not uncommon in organizations they're willing to leave it up to 
somebody else. Now, this, uh, however, uh, was one of the reasons that uh, our, a uh, so-called executive committee was formed, you see. And that committee was supposedly the committee in which great decisions were made and uh, uh, where uh, the differences would be fought out. Do you remember who had the power to appoint the executive committee? Was it chosen in the General Assembly of the General Conference, or was this responsibility left up to the president? I think initially uh, it was left up to uh, uh, the president with the, let's call it the concurrence of, uh, some degree of concurrence of the General Assembly. Uh, the initial, one of the meetings, at, the meeting at which the, sub, the name of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was fought out, uh, that was an interesting meeting that was held in Montgomery. And as I, you see, there was a great deal of discussion as to how to name it. And one of the uh, factors that apparently was pers uh, persuasive in terms of choosing the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was that if it were designated as a Christian organization, it would be a protective, provide some degree of protective uh, uh, mechanism against the charge of being uh, a communist, you see. I, this was... Now, this brings to, we, we talked about uh, the officially designated people in SCRC namely the executive board and the executive committee. Uh, can you recall uh, the role that these unofficial influential people uh, played in SCLC, like uh, Mr. Stanley Levinson? He was never designated an officer of SCLC, but it's quite apparent in looking at literature that he played a kind of significant role. As a matter of fact, um, two of you and Mr. Levinson met with uh, Reverend Tilly of New York and recommended certain things. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, uh, Reverend Tilly was named executive director. Uh, I'd like you to try and recall as best you can as well. How was this ex official role of Mr. Levinson perceived by the members of the organization? This is something I mentioned to you earlier, and I'd like to get it on tape. Uh, did they really know about him? I don't think that they, or oh, let's, there was wide knowledge of Mr. Levinson uh, per se as an official court uh, or an unofficial or what a per, uh, constant advisor uh, and, and consultant to Dr. King. I think this was more of a personal relationship on the part that I mean, might have been regarded by others that didn't know about it. So rather than use the term unofficial like I've been doing or uh, constant advisor uh, you think the best designation in referred to Mr. Levinson and his uh, contribution would be a constant friend of Martin Luther King? Well, I think uh, that would not be, uh, I think you would, it certainly would have to make a combination of friend and advisor because uh, it wasn't an official, he was not designated as an official advisor by the organization. He was not openly known. I'm not, I won't suggest that it was a covert action, uh, but it was not considered, un, it was not considered necessary to say that all the, uh, all the constituency, even of the executive committee, knew all the individuals uh, with whom, quote, the president consulted. And since out of the Montgomery situation, there had developed a basis, uh, a national and international basis uh, for Dr. King's relationships. Uh, it was presumed and assumed and accepted that if he found it advantageous or necessary to consult with or to receive recommendations from persons other than those within the official organization, it was uh, to be all right. So I don't think they knew too much about Stanley. Stanley, uh, however, had uh, been uh, initial, uh, <clears throat> had helped to provide the initial impetus, both for the, let's call it the format of a, uh, the, the creation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the establishment of a Southern-based mass organization, supposedly, 
and to provide uh, some of the financial or to channel financial assistance. And this was a crucial thing because at the close of the Montgomery uh, situation as such, as you perhaps historically know, there was a great deal of uh, question about uh, uh, no money and, uh, and the, the channels for receiving great sums of money that the SCL, uh, that the uh, Montgomery movement had uh, received were not open to SCLC and uh, it had to uh, find other channels for support and so then I'm sure there would not have been any question of uh, his relationship for him. and as far as but Martin found it advantageous because he was seemingly as you say uh, from your from the records you have he was not only a dedicated uh, but he was, at least was a constant supporter and advisor he was definitely former unofficial member of the advisory yes. group yes. of SCLC yes. and I was uh, trying to solicit from you uh, the best designation I could get of him and he suggested that I'd have to acknowledge his friendship and the advisor and the advisor uh, relationship and uh, if anyone uh, wished to be venal, uh, why well, you can almost uh, say that this uh, it could be interpreted as having uh, some uh, uh, implications beyond that. If you want to, if, if there's a venal. That's thing, what I was trying thing. to think about. You know, just just what all of this meant. You know, just what what uh, effect did this have on the direction that the organization. Know, the different kind of advice that uh, Dr. King was getting and the different kind of advice that he shone, you know. Uh, there were certain people that, uh, you know, I don't believe he would listen to too much, and uh, you might have been one of those people, you know. Do you understand? So I was yeah. just trying to get the direction, and I think you can tell a lot about an organization if you can find out where the greatest input is coming from. Well, I think one of the uh, yardsticks that might be used uh, to... Uh, is the fact that I don't think that uh, persons without, I'll put it this way, I'll put me positive, persons who were in position to provide both financial aid and uh, public relations assistance uh, to the furtherance of the organization or the furtherance of uh, the career of uh, the president uh, would be certainly high on the list of acceptable advisors. Uh, you see, Stanley was in position, I think he ran the money raising campaigns in, uh, in, in New York. Uh, he, uh, comes, he, comes, he comes out of the tradition, the Jewish tradition. He was part of the American Jewish Congress, I believe. And uh, as you know, that's a highly organized uh, money raising uh, organization they have a format. He was able to provide that and contact with others who as individuals would provide help and uh, also maybe he might have been motivated as other people in that area were motivated to give advice because of reasons that would be obvious and maybe some that may not have been obvious. I don't know whether this says anything. It says a whole lot. These are the kinds of things I'm trying to see. I know that there were certain groups of individuals that uh, he would have a natural almost affinity to, you know, that especially the ones who would uh, sustain what he regarded as being his efforts and happenings and at the same time bring in added money, yeah. uh, needed money. Uh, but let me jump back and, and, and try to see if we can come up with some uh, uh, notions of the character of the organization. Uh, this is an elusive kind of a thing because in the beginning, you know, they just were uh, ju joined together to try and lend direction or coordination to the various activities throughout the South. Uh, but beyond the initial idea of the organization, what kind of a character do you see the organization as having in its earlier stage? Do, do, do you, can you lend any kind of a character to it other than the fact that it was composed of ministers Know, didn't really know anything about organization. Uh, what, what, what kind of a character did it have? Uh, is that too broad or ambivalent question? Well, I don't know if it's ambivalent, but uh, 
I think the na- in the nature of the times, the character of the organization can best be defined as uh, something to meet the needs of uh, capitalizing upon the society, uh, the mass impact, or impact that Montgomery, uh, the Montgomery boycott had. Here you have a situation uh, historically unthought of and unpredicted, where thousands of individuals, uh, just black, ordinary people, uh, subjected themselves to inconveniences uh, that were certainly beyond the thinking of most folk, where they would walk old women and uh, maids uh, who uh, ran the risk of losing their little income would walk uh, to work if they got there rather than ride the buses. Now uh, this meant that you had a momentum that had not been seen even in the uh, um, work of the NAACP. Uh, and it was something that uh, uh, was uh, suggested a high potential for widespread mass action through the South. And um, so I think this has to be considered in any evaluation of uh, the uh, uh, SCLC, and uh, I may have lost my point. No, we were talking about the current government. You, you, you describing this uh, spontaneity of it and the exceptional capacity of that the people had uh, to sacrifice. Yes, uh, for for what they considered to be a point of liberation, and see this, it was supposedly designed to escalate that throughout the South. If you recall the first, that the organization meeting in Atlanta, it was called, uh, it had was tied up with the concept of, of transportation, That's right. mass action on transportation, right. which of course uh, was rather limited, but uh, the, the suggested to it. Yeah, it, it didn't come, I must say, it did not come from the group. Yeah, let's say it came somewhere else. Uh, so, but it was, but the whole concept was, we needed in the South a mass-based organization that might further the uh, uh, involvement of masses of people uh, as similar to what had taken place in Montgomery. It didn't have to be a bus boycott, but whatever. I think this is it. I don't know whether this... Yeah, well, you definitely speaking to what I was talking about. The you have to go to the inception and the motivation behind it being founded to, to really get at it. And uh, we, if we were to look at, say, uh, the Bolshevik re- Revolution in Russia, and this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, I'm trying to contrast the movement oh. here with other movements. And you know that they, that movement was rooted very deeply in ideological kinds of considerations. Uh, I'm searching for ideology in this movement, but it's so elusive uh, until I'm going to have to conclude, I believe, that there was no basic ideology involved in in, in the founding of SCLC, not really the NAACP, unless you don't call uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States an ideology, you know, because uh, they don't don't really uh, put out pamphlets, uh, write uh, conceptual frameworks, of uh, which is styles and ideology dealing with the system per se. They come up with uh, tactics and, and, and programs to deal to with problems right. dealing with race relations, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, really examine it. It's not so I clear in my mind, as you can see, but these are the kinds of things that I'm trying to look at here. No, they were. I don't think there was an ideology that certainly was comparable to uh, uh, the Marxist-Leninist concept of a changed society. Uh, the nearest to an ideology would be, let's call it, the Christian philosophy, and that tied in with the uh, 
a philosophy of Gandhian nonviolence, mass action, uh, nonviolent mass action. See, that was the nearest to it. Uh, but you see, this in itself becomes an elusive sort of a thing uh, when the uh, let's call it the impact of the uh, the need to glow uh, enters in and maybe the influence uh, upon individuals, uh, the individual leadership as to what shall we do next. And the, what shall we do next frequently uh, comes from suggestions to, from sources other than the organization, uh, like the identification with or speaking out against, uh, identification with the anti-war movement. This did not develop out of the organization. It's out of discussion within the organization. Uh, it no doubt came uh, the suggestion to the end of, to the president uh, and uh, uh, the invitation to the president to come and speak at the anti-war rally. And uh, I know something about uh, uh, somebody saying there's a time now for Martin to speak on uh, anti-war. Uh, do you think that this is the time for it? And uh, somebody would say, uh, uh, yes, it is. And somebody would talk to him, somebody that he felt uh, duty-bound, let's call it, to listen to. Okay. So the character then, and I'm trying to, to just uh, theorize here and just give almost essay kinds of responses, yeah. and I want your reaction to them. The character here then, as I said, would be uh, more and more on an action-oriented kind of a movement uh, than one which would lend itself to a somewhat long-term plan or an ideology uh, based on bringing about permanent social change or change in the system as such. And this action-oriented movement lent itself more to spontaneity than it did to the development of a structure uh, which would require a kind of rigid uh, format down through the years. Uh, so this, I think, more than anything else, would reflect uh, of the ultimate character uh, that was inherent in what SCIC was doing. Or would you differ with that? No, I wouldn't differ with it. I think you're quite correct there, because the personnel who uh, uh, provided the leadership for this or for SCLC had never come to grips uh, with a philosophical uh, con uh, concept other than the general concept of non-violent mass action. Now, the uh, uh, I don't think there was much, uh, I'll be gracious and say either time or other bases for uh, in-depth thinking about how far non-violent mass action can go and to what extent can you really involve people? You see, you may talk about them, but when you respond to, uh, as the organization did, to situations, uh, each situation, and their, their major, major efforts were in response to situations. And when you exhaust yourself, let's call it on situations like in uh, Florida, okay. or uh, situations in Albany. Like St. Albany. Uh, St. Albany and Albany, yes. Uh, what do you have? What do you, have? Uh, you see, because you have to, you, and the, all of this is being done within the context, uh, within the time period of two or three years. You see, uh, uh, the, uh, let's call it the uh, uh, overthrow of the Tsar. Yeah. It was not a two-year thing. Right. And uh, people, and maybe the, or maybe the, uh, the general format, not only the format, but the, uh, the. Uh, pattern of 